you have the harder job because you're going to be talking more than I will. So that's I okay. go like this. And that's okay. <laughs> you're used to it. You're okay. I'm good with it. I, I talk for five hours a day at my job all the time. So. Oh, fair enough. So you're doing that all the time. You're used to it. Yeah. You're just casually conversing 24-7, 365. Oh, except then I get home and I don't talk at all. You go into the, your just the sauna and I don't come out. <laughs> nice. How, how often, how long do you spend in the sauna? The I infrared? used to do like an hour. Yeah. As hot as it goes. Okay. Yeah, it goes up to 80. Nice. Um, so I was sitting there for an hour. But now I on a Sunday morning, I'll use it for like half an hour and that's about it. Infrared versus? It's typical. infrared, yeah. Do you like it more or less? Uh, I like it more because it's not as like the air doesn't get super hot. So you don't feel like you can't breathe. I find that in like a dry sauna, like your lungs hurt because you're sucking in like boiling air. It's awful. I, uh, I sp- try and spend at least half hour after every workout. Like it's just my go-to. It's just calming, get everything going, get Joe, the muscles. Joe Rogan style. Right. Just yeah. until you're ready to panic and then you get out. Exactly. I just don't take the selfie afterwards looking all red and shit. That's not my vibe. He's, he's America's reddest man. <laughs> Yo, uh, congratulations on 550 pounds. Quick poll, second workout of the day. No big deal, eh? Yeah, wake up, work out, work five hours, and then deadlift 550. I'll take it. Uh, not to mention waking up at 345. Yeah, well, this morning was a sleep in. I, I went till four. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Is that every day, 345? Just that's casual, no big deal? Yeah, so I mean, full disclosure, it started a few years ago. I went to Costa Rica, and everything there starts like pretty early. Came back to Canada. Decided I would try and start waking up earlier, do the meditation thing, the yoga thing. Um, and I kind of stuck with that. And then we had a baby and uh, it became a situation of when was I going to get my workout in. Non-negotiable for me is to get the workout in. So I started waking up early. It wasn't 4 or 3.40 to start. But uh, lo and behold, the baby started waking up earlier and earlier. And there was a period of time like four weeks ago where she was getting up at 6.30 every morning and I need at least two hours. So 4.30 to 6.30, I could get it done, but I want to wake up, have some coffee, watch Sports Center. So for the last four weeks, it's been, uh, it started at four and then it was 3.50 and then it was 3.40. So for four weeks now, it's been pretty consistent at 3.40 a.m. That's ridiculous. I have a couple questions. First off, like what time do you go to sleep? So that you can wake up at 3.45. Yeah, so uh, my daughter, she's 15 months. She goes to bed at 7.30. And uh, I'm often asleep at the exact same time. So 8 o'clock for me, if we're having a wild Friday night, I might make it to 8. But in reality, it's actually usually the opposite. So last night, my watch has me falling asleep at 6.49. And I woke up at 3.40. So Friday nights when we're uh, childless, I typically fall asleep on the couch pretty early. So is this typical for a Team Canada volleyball athlete to be on this schedule? No, absolutely not. I'm the anomaly. But uh, our matches were starting at 8 a.m. You know, internationally, usually 8 or 9 is the first game. In university, my coach at the time, Brenda Willis, she kind of instilled in us uh, kind of a team... Uh, a team rule was you're always vertical three hours before game time. And that kind of stuck with me. Like I graduated in 2010. And even in 2012, when I was playing, uh, if we had an 8 a.m. match, I, I'd, I'd wake up at five. So there is an advantage to being up early because that 8 a.m. game doesn't seem so early. And uh, those first matches of the tournament, you want to you want to win those. You want to jump on other teams early. And uh, if you can do that with an 8 a.m. game and, you know, you're fit as a fiddle at 8 a.m., it makes things a lot easier. The catch is it makes the 10 o'clock night game real challenging. But uh, thankfully, you play a lot more early matches than typically uh, late matches. So you just get the wins off early and then you take the L's occasionally at night if you have to. Yeah, or you take like a good long nap in the afternoon. Mm, That's true. Well, we have something in common. We both graduated in 2010. Okay. Yeah, I was elementary school, but... (laughs) Okay, yeah, that was... uh, I graduated in 2010 with my second degree. (laughs) Yo, so this is interesting. You went to Queens, competed in five straight OUA championships, yep. then went to Western, Western, competed in another couple there as a coach. Yep. Let's maybe take things back a level, start back like high school, university days, maybe take us through your experience there. I know you've mentioned that you weren't the best of the best no, going through I, high school. I think I wasn't very good is what I use. <laughs> I, we like to try and, you know, pump the tires a bit. But well, we <laughs> did talk about deadlifting 550 already, so. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay so we'll go back. We'll, we'll pull the tape back a bit then and let's start let's hear like going through high school what it was like for you training learning about the sport 
identifying whether this is something you want to do for the rest of your life. Yeah, so I mean, a story I tell a lot was I was I was a pretty good hockey player. Um, I played AAA for a long time and then started to fall down through the ranks and it became a, a decision as to whether or not I was going to play hockey or volleyball. And at the start of high school, that's what I did. I, I quit hockey and I, I started playing volleyball in the in the winters and in the summers I was I was racing mountain bikes. But it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to go to university and play volleyball. It was just something I had a lot of fun doing. And I actually got recruited like by almost nobody. And at Provincials, Brenda Willis at Queens, she saw something I guess other people didn't and uh, asked if I was willing to attend Queens. And I actually applied there as like my last school um, because at the time you could get three schools for like 200 bucks. And I had five schools and then the smartest guy on my team went to Queens. So I was like, all right, I'm going to apply there. Went on a recruiting trip and I signed my like letter of intent at the time Mm -hmm. then. And um, yeah, it wasn't until I got to university where things started to kind of come together. Brenda was a really tough coach. She had a reputation of someone who was like really hard on her players. Um, And I really resonated with that. And that's really where the work ethic that got me to where I am today started. So I was a little bit later than a lot of guys in the sport. But I think as a result, I outlasted almost all of my graduating. Well, I did outlast all of my graduating class and all the guys I played with, they're all long out of the sport. But I think just that the fact that right away, I wasn't kind of like identified as the guy, I always felt like I had a lot left to do. I think there's something to be said for being the underdog. Yeah. And having that little chip on your shoulder, you're like, hey, I can do this just as good as you maybe I haven't proven it and you haven't seen it yet but I I can do this yeah and funny enough uh you know both Brenda who was my coach at Queens she told me I was potentially cut a few times and uh the national team coach for Beach also told me I was potentially cut a a couple times and in both situations it, it worked out in my favor in the end so I'll take it how was the transition from indoor to beach not necessarily a seamless thing that people can do. Yeah, and I mean, something that people um, from the outside, they often treat them as two separate sports. Mm -hmm. Uh, Growing up, you often play indoor in the winter and beach in the summer. So I was probably always a better beach volleyball player than I was an indoor volleyball player. And I was always playing beach in the summer. So even getting ready to go to Queens, you know, I was still playing beach all summer. We'd play indoor for the entire season. And then uh, I would just go play beach all summer for four months in Toronto. And in 2007 was when I made the youth national team to compete overseas. And that was my first international competition. So they really go hand in hand. The difference is an indoor, um, it's a huge advantage to be a specialist right. in beach volleyball. It's a huge advantage to be a generalist. Right. And you're, you're more of the, the sledgehammer, yeah, as j- you refer to yourself. Jack of all trades who hits the ball as hard as he can. That it's I love the way you describe it on a couple of different podcasts that you've been on. You're like, yo, if I can hit... If I can be the hammer, I don't care how well you can dig that ball. You're not getting it up after I smash it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to approach the game. I'm assuming the same as every sport at the highest level. And you really have to migrate towards your strengths. And one of my strengths has always been strength. So um, I've always, you know, just... I've been successful using that to my advantage. And statistically, uh, you know, we're hitting the ball so high, so hard that the attacker has the advantage. We side out at such a high level. Mm-hmm. Defensive conversions are, are so rare. So I, I, I rolled with it and it worked for a long time. And you're hitting these balls at like 100 clicks an hour. Yeah. We're, I mean, we're serving the ball at 100 clicks an hour. So yeah. we are hitting it faster and you are also significantly closer like when we're serving the ball at you you have i mean 16 meters is end line to end line so maybe you have 12 but when we're attacking the ball from the net you're maybe only five meters away so 100 kilometers an hour five meters away is it's it's lightning fast yeah it's getting to you quick i've had a couple of pucks shot at me at that speed and at least I have goalie gear on at that point, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least ours is full of air. Um, concussions were not a thing in volleyball for the longest time. And now they're starting to realize that maybe there are those happening in the sport. But uh, I've been fortunate enough that I, I've taken a few off the dome and I've been okay. Yeah, I can't imagine it would feel good to have sunglasses on and then a pounded ball 
square in this nose. Like that's not a good feeling. <laughs> yeah. So nose is by far the worst. It's like if you take it clean in the face, that that sucks pretty bad. If you're wearing a hat, a lot of the times it'll hit the beak of the hat, which makes things a lot easier, but it makes a super loud pop. It sounds like a gunshot going off because you break the cardboard in your hat. Um, but a lot of the times you're actually trying to look like down and press over the net. So it'll actually hit you on the top of the head. If it hits you on the top of the head, you're all good. And I mean, something people don't realize is you actually like, you want your sunglasses to break. So the best sunglasses will actually shatter because when it hits you, the sunglasses will break instead of go into your face, right? So they'll break and fall off. Um, if you have a pair of sunglasses that doesn't break, you're going to get cut all across the eye and across the bridge of your nose. So just make sure you have a couple pairs, but they're, they're gone after they get hit. Here's your parents. They're like, yeah, go play volleyball. It's such a friendly sport. You're not going to be getting injured. Here you are like tearing the back of your knee cap off like I, I would love to hear your injury stories like how you recovered from them this is something that athletes have to deal with in any sport at every age whatever it is but I think you went through a pretty gruesome one you have products that you've used to help you recover from them but like maybe explain what happened and how you recovered yeah from it. yeah so I would say I've had two like semi-major one major one semi-major I had my shoulder I had some issues with my shoulder and then I had like a major injury with my knee, but uh, I would say both are fairly typical for volleyball players, knees and shoulders. My supraspinatus had like a 0.7 centimeter tear in it. Um, anything over 0.5 is clinically significant. So it's not that much bigger than like something we would just not even pay attention to, but it resulted in like a lot of pain after games and it was just becoming a nuisance. So I had PRP done on my shoulder, which is like, we take blood, we spin it, we re-inject the red blood cells. Um, although it wasn't like a major surgery, it, it for sure was the most painful thing I've ever done in my life. It was injected almost like right where the tendon inserts on the bone. So it's a very sensitive area. It's not like we're shooting it into your quads or anything. Um, so my arm went dead for like six weeks. Um, and then I was able to use it and play, but it's, it's a quick turnaround. It's like two months and you're going to be a hundred percent, but it still took two months out of practice in the off season and our off season is not very long. So it's kind of like you finish playing, get a medical procedure and then you're rushed right back. And that is your off season. Yeah. And that's what happened with my knee. I, I tore the cartilage on the back of my patella at the Commonwealth games and uh, it never really kind of dealt with itself. So I was always taking medication and I was able to play at a high level, but it took a lot of time every day to make sure I could play. And then when COVID hit and we realized that the whole season was going to be canceled in October of 2019, I had knee surgery to just cut the flap off and uh, start climbing back. And I came back faster than I should have because with the Olympic qualification was starting and we needed to be training and going to California. So I was getting a lot of injections at the time to try and manage swelling. And I, again, I was able to play. Uh, it wasn't the most comfortable. I was still playing at an extremely high level, arguably the highest I've ever played at, but it just took so long every single day before and after a game to, to manage that. And it's so much better now after a period of like dedicated strength training and a little bit of reduced volume when it comes to jumping. But I think every athlete's got that story with something they've had to deal with. And, you know, those were mine. The most fascinating part about your journey is your knowledge behind the sport that you are playing and your master's degree, what you're doing now as a career outside of volleyball. Like, can you maybe speak to what you've learned throughout the process? Cause you said at the beginning that you wish you knew kind of what you have now as far as knowledge. Yeah. And I mean, so coming into the sport again, always having to work as hard as I could to kind of prove that I could do this, that translated to the weight room. So I was, uh, like, it was my life off the court was how can I continue to build my body to be in a position to be successful as a professional athlete. And probably at times I didn't make the smartest decisions when it came to like volume or exercise uh, selection or intensity. Um, we just thought more was better. And, uh, you know, that probably caught up to me in my career without me even knowing it. And I think now that, you know, I've had some time off the court after this last Olympic run and, you know, I'm training exclusively in my basement on my own. And now that I'm training, you know, hundreds of clients around the world and I've gotten feedback from them, it's become like 
very apparent how much more, you know, proper exercise selection, um, you know, RPEs or, or monitoring intensity or, or using tech to monitor different components of your lift, how valuable that can be um, in accelerating what you're doing in the weight room to help supplement you in your sport, right? And that's what I'm trying to pass on now is that, you know, there, you don't have to do things the way I did. You can, you can go that way and there will be people who will be successful that way. But, um, there's also a, there's an in-between, right? So maybe we live in that gray and, uh, maybe I would have played a little bit longer. Maybe I wouldn't have got to where I am now, but, uh, I think, um, moving forwards, I think that's where, you know, strength and conditioning within sports is, is, is migrating towards. It's very rare for a volleyball player to also then join the powerlifting team. Yeah, the Western gym team. <laughs> like very opposite ends of the spectrum typically. Yeah. Can you maybe speak to how that allowed you to become like one of the top four in Canada, arguably around the world? Yeah, so um, when I was at Queens, I was like 160 pounds when I went in and I, I was like- a What big, height, sorry, also? because Same height, same same height? height? Like okay. six, six five, 198 centimeters. But um, so I went- I went to Queens, like I was basically, you know, like a skinny tree branch. And uh, I was good at volleyball from an IQ perspective, not a physical perspective. And in my third year, I don't know what happened, but just kind of a fire was lit under me that I wanted to, I wanted to no longer be that skinny guy. Uh, I graduated Queens at 220. So like, yeah, I put on 60 pounds in like three years, not the right way but my goal was just to get in the weight room work as hard as i could eat as much food as i could and no longer be 160 pounds um when i was done at queens i thought volleyball was over for me i went to western to do my masters and i thought great i'm just going to do my masters of physio i'm going to be a physiotherapist for the rest of my life and and that's a great life and uh so i ended up the first like few days i was there meeting these like meatheads in the back corner of like western's grimy gym and they had these western gym shirts on and they're all deadlifting and squatting massive numbers and i was like these seem like the guys that i want to make friends with so i did and um it resulted in like it, there was nothing formal about it it was just everyone whenever you went there was always that group of guys in some form in that corner doing crazy stuff. And I was like, this feels like sports to me. So I, I like this, I will continue to do this. And that's where like, I really started to understand more like formal technical aspects of lifting weights instead of like you're with 12 guys and you've got a strength coach who's a third year phys ed student. It was like these guys, like this was what they did. This was their, this was their volleyball. And uh, I got crazy strong and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And I just continued that when I was done. But while I was doing that, I kind of got asked to come back to the sport. And um, that's when I realized I came back to the sport and all of a sudden I was jumping like eight inches higher. It was, it was wild. I was never wow. a big jumper at Queens. And then I left, I started deadlifting and squatting like crazy and I, I jumped way higher. And I was like, okay, this is, something is changing here maybe. I'm not done in the sport and I came back and I had a ton of success and then I started playing internationally once I made the national team and it just kind of steamrolled into today. That's, that's wild. Okay. What were you eating to gain 60 pounds? <laughs> like cheeseburger diet strictly? Yeah, so or? It, it wasn't good. Like there's some vivid memories I have. So I was taking like mass gainer, right? Like a thousand calories a shake yeah. and I mean, I haven't told these stories in a long time, but I vividly remember like coming home from the gym, drinking, drinking a shake, throwing it up and then drinking another one because I couldn't sacrifice that thousand calories. And I remember my mom coming on my birthday and making hamburgers and my mom being like, like, what are you doing? Like you are visibly uncomfortable. And I was like, I know, but I, I need to be eating more. And like I said, I, I never did it the right way, the way that everyone should do it. I, I, I never knew how many calories I was consuming. I just knew if I ate more, I would probably gain weight. Right. And yeah. I understand now so much more about how to do it the right way. And it doesn't need to be that uncomfortable and painful, but at the time I didn't know any better. So, you know, I was just slugging pre-workout mass gainer and eating as much as I physically could. It's crazy to hear stories from these world-class athletes that wish they knew what they knew now and like going through those experiences having you know crushing cheeseburgers crushing all of these mass gainers and it's like man how the body is incredibly fit 
and able to handle whatever you throw at it, even if it is masking or in pre-workout for years straight and that you can still come out of it in fantastic shape. Yeah. And I mean, I think back then, like this, you know, when I was going through Queens, like Facebook was coming out. So it's like, social media was not a thing there right yeah. these you know to get this information like you were going to like t nation and like it was it was like bodybuilder stuff it wasn't out there accessible to the average joe now we have like you know everyone and their sister on instagram trying to tell you what to eat so now it's almost the opposite there's there's too much information and the information is so technical that sometimes it's just not applicable like it becomes white noise for the youth right and i think that when you look at the strength and conditioning world i mean nutrition is a whole different ball game but if even if you look at s and c it's become so complicated that no one knows what to do so they just migrate to what's flashy so we have all these trainers out there who and volleyball players migrating to these trainers that make zero sense to do but it looks cool right whoever can make the best video on instagram and tiktok is going to get the most followers and the most likes yeah and get exactly the most views. and then they're like on a bosu ball pistol squatting to try and jump higher and like well maybe you're in the same situation i was throwing up eating mass gainer but now it's just somebody telling you to do it on instagram yeah well, and that's so the origin for the athletes podcast is to educate, entertain and inspire that next generation of athletes. And one of the things that I want to do is make sure that these stories are told mm -hmm. so that we don't have stories 10 years from now. Team Canada volleyball players being like, yeah, I was crushing mass gainer every day for <laughs> three years to make sure I got over 200 pounds. Right. Like this is where these stories can be so impactful for those who are listening and watching. What other things do you wish you knew? you know, at the age of 15, 12, 20, that you would have gone back, changed, adjusted. You talked about volume. You talked about training. Like anything specific stand out to you that you think? Yeah. I mean, sleep was always a, like a priority for me, but I didn't understand why. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that I was like, I, I need to get eight hours. Even in university, like uh, my wife now, my girlfriend at the time, um, we would like work until 10 o'clock and then we'd hang out till 1030 and go to bed. So we weren't like except obviously on the weekends or going out. But for the most part, we were in bed relatively early. And I didn't really understand like what that was doing for me until like relatively recently. And I think like understanding the importance of sleep on recovery, like cognitive processing, reaction time, strength, like it is the lowest hanging fruit that we can do when it comes to like a modality to make us physically better. Um, so like simple things like that, I wish I knew the value of sleep. I wish I, I knew how important sleep and nutrition were for recovery instead of like, okay, we're going to foam roll and we're going to foam rolling was huge when I was in university or we're going to stretch yeah. like stretching is bullshit. Foam rolling is bullshit. Just like eat and sleep and you've taken care of 90% of things. But this is basic information that like, I really wish I knew. Of course, I wish I knew about like training intensity or monitoring, like using velocity based training to understand like where in the spectrum I am on a day to push or, or, or not to push. Um, but I mean, those are like training specific things. I think when it comes to like overall mentality as an athlete, one of the things I wish I knew is that like whatever is happening right now, it might feel like it's the most important thing that will ever happen to you in your life, but it, it's not, there's going to be another one and there's going to be another one. And all of those are going to feel like the most important thing in your life. And if, if you don't execute right now, it's over, but it, it's just, it's a lie we're telling ourselves. Right. And it's creating so much fear and so much panic. And it's, resulting in such a like a results driven mindset instead of a process driven mindset and i think if i would have understood that like as a youth athlete i i, I wouldn't have panicked about so many things early on in my career it's it's such a shame because it's so true it's so accurate and you have people who are going through living their youth and they lose it because they're so focused on your favorite quote of getting 1% better every single day to just make sure that they're going to achieve that next goal and get to that next point when it's like, yo, appreciate where you're at right now. Yeah. What you're doing is amazing. You're probably having an incredible time playing your sport that you love with your friends. You're probably never going to be able to do that again. And if you are in five or 10 years, you're going to be paid for it. So it's a different dynamic at that point. Yeah. Like, just enjoy when you're young, yeah. having the ability to go and do every sport under the sun compete with all of your friends live your life you don't have any other responsibilities like that's the game changer for me i'm like man i, 
I would have been such a better golfer if I wasn't worried about, you know, what I had to do after golf or what I had to do the next day to make sure I played better hockey. Yeah. And I think the, the thing to ask yourself as a youth is like, if, if you are not having the best time right now in this moment playing your sport, why? And if you can answer that question, things become a lot easier. Okay. Like why I'm, a, I'm afraid to lose this game. Okay. What happens? What happens if you lose this provincial championship final and you get second? Nothing. Nothing happens. You're the same person that started the game, that ended the game. Like your skills are the exact same. You might not have played great, but nothing has changed. And when you put that in perspective, like we're playing volleyball, we're, we're hitting a ball around a helicopter pad in a sandbox. Like it's a pretty privileged situation. And you know, when it comes back to, you know, myself growing up right now is like the provincial championships for youth indoor volleyball over the next like month and nationals. And, you know, when I look back, another tweet that I always put out is like, I never won a 14U championship, a 16U and 18U championship. I won my first provincial championship at 24 and under men. So it took me a long time to get there. But we have these, you know, volleyball now starts at 12. So we have these 12 U kids who are going out like ship hunting, right? They want the banner. And it's like, that's, that's fine that you want to do that. But just know those kids that I played against that won all of those, they, they never made it to where I was. So sure, you can do that and you can make it all the way. There's those superstars that do that. But that wasn't my story. Mine was like, uh, you know, I, I, I got on the podium a few times, but I never won nationals. I've never won nationals for beach volleyball. The only provincials I won was I won 24 and under provincials. I won that a couple times, but uh, yeah, I was a little bit late to the the ship. That was like one of the main things I wanted to chat about with you specifically with was like, hey, like I love the fact that you didn't win anything until that U24 and you battled through that adversity because that's the sign of someone who has an engine that won't stop, even if they don't get the accolades right away and immediate like success to build on right and like that can be difficult as a human you're like i'm working at this i'm striving for it and i'm not seeing the results immediately like kids are starting hockey at five years old and like trying to become the next Sidney crosby or Connor mcdavid and it's like man maybe if you played a couple other sports for those 10 15 years you would have learned so many additional skills built your hand eye figured out oh maybe hockey isn't my favorite sport yeah. to be playing to your point and that's when you end up actually finding your true passion you get really into it you learn that hey weightlifting and volleyball is something that i can combine maybe i can start building programs on and start teaching the next gen yeah. after my career's done right but you would have never known that if you didn't have the curiosity to go to that corner of the gym lift deadlift with them yeah and i was never a single sport athlete like growing up my dad let me try everything and, you know, even leading into university in the winters, I was playing volleyball with my club team in Barrie and I was uh, sponsored for freestyle skiing. So those were the two sports I did in the winter. And uh, in the summer, I played beach volleyball and uh, I raced mountain bikes on the Ontario Cup circuit. So I, I, even when volleyball was my priority, I was still playing another sport multiple times a week. And, uh, you know, as a ski instructor and a freestyle skier, I was skiing like five days a week. We would we would instruct at Snow Valley and then we'd finish our shift and we drive to Blue Mountain because the, the jumps were bigger and you know I just think that diversity and experiences when it comes to movement like we're not even talking sport like it, this doesn't have to be an organized sport just the diversity of movement serves people so well and you know it's it's something we're losing as a culture because everyone thinks they're going to make the NHL at <laughs> five years old <laughs> what's uh it's yeah for, I can't I don't even want to touch on that but What's your, the biggest thing you're dealing with clients on a daily basis, 10, 15 people a day. What's the biggest thing that you see from that older generation that could be corrected for younger athletes and like, Hey, this is something you should be aware of now to make sure that in 10, 20 years, you don't have a bad back or you don't have mobility issues. Like, are there certain things that people should be implementing at a younger age, whether it's, you know, specific workout routines or specific movements that are kind of essential for longevity yeah well i mean i think there's a i think like we're in the in-between i think the the older generation like you know you think about guys we watched playing hockey growing up like gary roberts right like gary roberts is a machine and that guy smashed in the gym right and we have a little bit of that in us um so now when those people are parents of youth they migrate to what was successful in their time right so what i'm seeing in youth sport right now is these kids are being overloaded with volume like crazy so they're practicing and 
exceptional amount. You know, when I was growing up practicing for volleyball, we were practicing one day a week for two hours and it wasn't so structured. It was a lot of free play, a lot of movement. Um, these kids now are practicing three days a week, four days a week for three hours at a time. So their volume is three times what we were doing. And, and okay, you want to do crazy volume. That's fine. You have to take measures to make sure that those kids can tolerate that level of volume. So, you know, my advice is that's what I'm seeing as these, these people who are becoming coaches for their kids. Now they're, they're overloading them with extreme volume without like physiologically preparing them for that volume. Right. That same generation thinks that lifting weights for kids is going to stunt their growth still, right? Lifting weights for kids doesn't need to be a barbell on their back or, you know, deadlifting 550 before we do a podcast. Like getting some bands and working on some hip stability, some shoulder stability, some core control, um, you know, like change of direction. Those things will translate to them being able to tolerate that volume more. But at the same time, we should probably titrate that volume down to a more appropriate level. It's very popular in the NBA right now, right? To be talking about load management. And for a long time, when that came up, everyone was like, what the fuck is load management? Like, why does Kawhi got to sit a few games? And everyone's like, no, he's not tough. But that's the reality of what we're in now. We're, we're overloading these kids in a single movement pattern. They're only playing hockey. They're only playing volleyball. And they play it so much that it just becomes too much at a point. It's interesting. It feels like these pendulum shifts occur, whether it's politics, whether it's sports, whatever. It's just like we we like to go to extremes oh, yeah. in this world. And people are like, what's that thing that I can do to get this much better? And it'll swing all the way. And then it's like, oh, OK, we figured out that you can put your knees over your toes. And you're just going to say, are we only going to squat to 90 or are we going to squat it all the way over? But that bothers me so much. We need to live in the gray. Like, you know, I see knees over toes is incredibly popular for jumping athletes right now. And, you know, he promotes extreme flexibility and, you know, to go as far as possible. And then you have other trainers who are saying, don't go below 90 degrees. But the reality is we should probably live in the gray at some point. We probably should go to extreme range of motion at some point. We probably should cut our range of motion when we have higher loads, but it's not that this is the only way. And I think that we've become a culture that, that is um, rewarded. The extremes are rewarded. If you take it like uh, practices, there's going to be kids out there who join a club because their team's practicing five days a week and they're like, they're the best club in the world because they have so much volume. And then there's going to be clubs that say, we only go once a week. And there's going to be a ton of kids who want to play there because they're like, this is the best. We'll be so recovered. But in reality, somewhere in the middle is, is probably what will serve everyone the best. I think it comes down to just making sure that you adjust accordingly and you keep your body guessing like man <laughs> confuse the muscles right like and it's not just say like okay jump on a bosu ball squat do this that the other thing that's like okay that's not gonna work let's like make sure we keep our foundational levels but like you have to have a guy like jordan shallow who's putting up crazy weights and then you can also have a day where you're maybe lighter and you're focusing on that squeeze and making sure that you are going full range of motion yeah. instead of trying to pull 600 pounds or whatever that number is that day. There's a, there's a time and a place for everything. Right. And I think we kind of were talking about it earlier, like, you know, something I, I should have been better at understanding as a youth athlete was that there is a time and a place because I think growing up, I might've been on that extreme where, you know, I was always trying to push myself so hard, but there was a time and a place to understand that maybe not jumping at practice today was, was the best thing I could do, or maybe deloading this week, even though the paper says deloads in three weeks, might be you know the right call and uh, i think as uh, maybe youth athletes start to make that aware themselves aware of that um, it can go a long way but i think we need to have the the responsibility to teach them that we need to show them that you know not always just working harder makes the most sense right you know i say like don't work harder work smarter and i also hate that so much but i would rather you know the youth or anyone be intelligent about the way they approach whatever it is their occupation strength training you know their sport if we can intelligently approach any of those domains then you're, you're probably going to be successful yeah I'll, I'll be honest i fell victim to it like if i was trying to get shredded i was doing f45s every day doing way too much cardio like not giving my time to recover and it's like okay maybe i got the results in the short term but my bounce back was way worse because I wasn't doing that much cardio, wasn't doing that much working out. So my body just afterwards was like, oh, I adapted to this and 
now you're expecting me to adapt to no cardio and way more calories and you're not burning them off. Yeah. And I think those fluctuations, it's about, you know, what can you sustain long term? And if you bring it back to, you know, we're kind of talking about how screwed up diet culture is, but it's the same thing. If you can't stick to a nutritional regimen for a long period of time, it doesn't make sense. And the same thing goes with whether it be, you know, your sporting intensity or what you're doing in the weight room. If it's not something that you can sustain long term, you're going to run into different problems in different domains, but it's you're probably not going to be as successful if you were just living a little more in the gray. I wish I lived a bit more in the gray, but this is what we're doing now. We got a podcast. We're staying consistent. <laughs> We've got sustainable actions in place now. I'm not know? sure pulling a one rep max before a podcast was in the gray, but everything else about that was true. Hey, we got to change it up. We got to keep the body guessing. Like we said, <laughs> our knees were definitely over our toes. These were over our toes. That was the biggest I've pulled 525. I got up yep. once barely there. You no, were... no, no. That was not not barely you didn't even drop it because i told you you'd break my foundation you lowered that down like a pro we uh well you know what we had to focus on the eccentric part of the movement that yeah, was that's the goal, huge. right yeah you i'm know? good with that and that's like you said you attribute a lot of the strength that you've gained from just having to focus on that aspect yeah exactly so i mean you know to bring it all back i got stuck in guitar came home no gyms so i had to build this and now this is like really my happy place but having a home gym is a little bit different than a public gym. I'll admit I was the guy deadlifting who would like bring her up and just let her fly down with gravity. And, uh, you can't do that at three o'clock in the morning if your baby's sleeping or your wife is sleeping. So, um, there's also like a pride in the equipment you own. You've spent a lot of money in it. I don't think people realize like how expensive a home gym can be when you're trying to be as specific as I was, but you know, that pride of ownership results in you taking really good care of stuff. And as a result, you don't want to drop it. You don't want to drop your adjustable dumbbells, your barbells. But as a result, without you even knowing it, you train part of the system that most people don't, right? And I think that resulted in, you know, some crazy strength gains for myself was just focusing on the lowering because I didn't want to drop anything. That's why we we brought on guys like Jordan Syatt, the Mind Pump Media team, to also educate athletes on like the training and how important it is to focus on the movement, not just the athletic sport endeavor that you are currently pursuing yeah. because the gym can unlock so much more in that sport yeah. for you than just sitting there and doing lines on the ice like, yeah. or hitting golf balls or whatever it is. Exactly. But I think the other thing too, that's becoming in vogue in the age of social media is making the gym look so much like our sport that it's not even really the gym anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing that in the space that I'm in, training volleyball, and it's very niche, right? You know, there's not like, you, you couldn't name anyone but me doing it, but uh, I can name a few. But that's what's happening is the gym is becoming basically the sport. And uh, I, I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't think we should be using super light loads to imitate an arm swing because when it comes game time, you're going to default to your strongest pattern. And that strongest pattern is not going to be you with a red band pretending you're hitting a volleyball or working on rotation. It's going to be when you were doing like explosive, you're doing that rotational component with a med ball at high velocity. That's way heavier load than a, a red band, but that's what it's becoming. The Instagram and social media is promoting these, these, these crazy exercises that look way more like your sport, but what relevance do they have? And, you know, just like you mentioned with Jordan, it's like, okay, so we're, we're deadlifting in the gym. We're, we're pushing heavier weights. Those patterns are going to serve you in your sport, but they're also going to serve you in another sport too. Let's, let's get rid of the red bands and the thoracic rotation. Let's make it a thoracic rotation with some loads so that when you are put in a position that's not perfect, your body has some capability to withstand that. So true. You brought up Qatar. I want to talk a bit about, you know, some qualifiers, maybe some wins, losses yeah. that went along through that. I want to first bring up the fact that you guys can't get fans to come out to these <laughs> exotic places that you get to travel to, which is a pro, like looks beautiful yeah. when you get to go visit those spots. But when you have no one watching, unless they're being paid to do so, yeah, yeah. like that's a crazy dynamic to have to wrap your head around. And it's probably counterintuitive to what you grow up imagining that, yeah. you know, as you're qualifying for the Olympic games, you're going to have a bunch of people watching, cheering you on that are actually invested in the sport. Yeah, exactly. So I think volleyball is at a little bit of a, it's, it's at a crossroads. 
um, the heyday of volleyball was like the 80s and 90s in the States where, you know, they're, they have thousands of people watching regular games in California. Um, and, you know, now we're in a situation where it's, it's not as popular as it was there because we went through a formalization period. Like the first year of volleyball was in the Olympics was 96. And you think about skateboarding in the Olympics now, there's pushback, right? We were a lifestyle sport and now we're becoming like a formalized, internationally governed body sport. Um, but when that first happened, the popularity was still there. Right. But there was something that changed. I don't know if it was the delivery of the product or, or what it might be. And I, I, I mean, one part has to be the fact that we're trying to push the sport to the corners of the world that aren't receptive to it. You know, if we have a tournament in Poland, they're, they're going to be fans around the stadium. We have tournaments in Austria, places where volleyball is huge, Italy. We're going to have fans like lining up Brazil to, to watch the games. But... The Olympics is about inclusivity and expanding the sport to the reaches of the earth where it might not be exposed to. They want everyone an opportunity to participate. And as a result, our tournaments have started to become in these super exotic locations. Um, you know, they have a tournament this year in the Maldives. Like, we're not going to have anyone there but tourists. Like, maybe a few tourists are going to watch. Qatar, amazing country to get to go play volleyball. Like, I got to go out in four runners in the desert, smash dunes, like, see Saudi Arabia, like, tent in the desert amazing place to get to go play volleyball not a great place for people to watch volleyball so there's there's no one in the stands in the finals and that makes it even harder uh for the product of volleyball to be sold the nhl is going through a similar manner right like who goes and watches a game in arizona mm -hmm. right like let's get the expos back for baseball like you know who is it the the a's right they have like 5,000 people in their stadium per game like it's it's not a good look for any major sport and especially ours a sport that's trying to you know gain mainstream attention mainstream sponsors mainstream funding for the athletes because i think that's the biggest thing is our sport's not viewed by a lot of people and our, our athletes get paid like garbage yeah. so it needs to change and it's especially important when you've got low barriers to entry in a sport like volleyball yeah right like that's one you got a net you got a cross net whatever whatever it is you put up there and it's like yo you need a ball come play right like it's not golf where you have to spend thousands of dollars on equipment yeah it's not hockey like those are the sports if anything that we should be pushing so hard to get out there because frankly not enough of the youth nowadays are getting exposure to sport and getting comfortable going outside playing new things trying new stuff mm -hmm. getting movement like we're sitting on screens COVID and, didn't help with that, but it's and, tough. One of the things people don't realize about volleyball is, is volleyball is in the top four most popular sports in the world. Wow. Like, like volleyball is more popular than football, Whoa. not, not soccer, football. Like, so we have the NFL, but the NFL is a North American sport, mm -hmm. right? You look at the world's most popular sports, cricket, soccer, volleyball, right? Wow. Volleyball might be four, but it, it, people don't believe that. You go to a, a game in Europe, an indoor volleyball game in Europe, and they're playing them in soccer stadiums with the court in the middle of the soccer stadium. Like that's like NCAA Final Four stuff, right? Yeah. But th this is volleyball. You go down to Ashbridge's Bay today, 15 minutes down the road, there's a hundred courts and every single one of those courts will be full. But what happens is there, it, it, it dwindles off, right? Because the opportunities are limited at the top end. So these kids enter in because yeah, their parents are like, hey, we can buy you a volleyball for 50 bucks. You don't have to have shoes. We'll take you down to the beach. It's free. And I spent 50 bucks in the whole summer. You got to play a sport. And you got vitamin D. Yeah. So that's, a, that's it's, it's attractive to get those kids in. The NCAA has women's beach volleyball. So it's a little bit different. More females are staying in the sport. But I'm like, I remember in high school getting made fun of, like I got bullied for playing volleyball. Like people would just be like, you're a girl. Like you play girl sport. And you know, it, it, there's still that mentality floating around when it comes to the sport. And as a result, as we get closer to the top, we don't have guys like me sticking around. They they go play indoor or they, they play a different sport. So beach is, is unique in the fact that like there's lots of people who play, but there's not a lot of people who stick with it. Yeah, it was interesting that I was mentioning beforehand, like the McNamara twins who we had on yeah. two years ago got into the sport of beach. They're playing down at UCLA, but like you don't see a lot of those nowadays, right? And it's they're an anomaly, two blonde twins who are phenomenal at volleyball now representing Canada. But 
you don't have that story. I got the same thing in grade eight playing volleyball, most improved, but I was also getting fun, made fun of. You got three of those awards. I got one. It's okay. We'll same leave. exact same level too, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was basically playing on team Canada, exactly. but the, that is, it's like, I didn't have any interest in continuing on with volleyball because uh, if I could play football, golf, hockey, basketball, volleyball was like my fifth option. I'm like, I'm getting chirped to play this. Why would I continue doing that? Yeah, exactly. Not to ma- like, I don't mind adversity, but like, I'm not going to put myself into this if I don't have to. Yeah. And I mean, you didn't even know it paid peanuts either. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, as soon as someone tells you that, that like, Hey, you're going to be self-funded, like yeah. you're going to have to pay for all of this yourself. And if you win a little bit of money, you're supposed to be really happy. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you tell people that a lot of people don't realize that, you know, as a Canadian national team member, we get a very small stipend, but everything else is covered by us. All our flights, all our hotels, coaching fees, all our food, like our, our individual coach, we have to pay for our own coach their salary. It's not provided by the national team. And uh, that's a huge barrier to entry. Like the youth kids, they need to know that in grade nine. If it's like, hey, when I'm done high school, I want to be a professional volleyball player. Well, you need to start getting your ducks in a row now so you can figure out how you can do that because you might be the best volleyball player in the world. But if you can't fund yourself to go around the tournaments and play, then you can't get points. You can't get points. You can't go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. can't go to the Olympics. Then what are you doing? Right? Yeah. Well, and that's Probably why I assume in 2016, you kind of started turning your Instagram into a business account. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I got uh, called into a careers class to talk about like my story with a a fan in Mississauga one time. And I think the careers teacher was like livid with me at the end of it because my whole thing was like, you guys live in an age where if if you don't want to go to university, you don't you don't have to go. If you want to talk about cats on YouTube, you might make more than your teacher. So find something (laughs) 10 times more, (laughs) find something you're good at and and leverage it. And for me in 2016, you know, I was like a little bit late to the game with Instagram, but at the time it was just like where you posted pictures from like Friday night or like, I don't know, you saw something artsy, so you over filtered it and up it went, but it, it wasn't like how many followers you have, or there wasn't really a way to monetize it. And then leading into 2016, I, I started to realize that this was where things were going. Like mm-hmm. This was such a low barrier to entry for brands to contact athletes or for you to contact brands. And it didn't cost them very much to sponsor you versus make a commercial, yeah. right? So how do you transform this this social into something that's a, that's a business? And I remember telling my partner, I was like, in four years, I'm going to sign a major sponsor. Like before we go to the Olympics, I'm going to have a major sponsor and it's going to be because of Instagram. And uh, I treated it like a business and I got made fun of all the time because people were like what are you doing on your phone? I'm like, I'm liking photos. And they're like, how many photos do you like a day? And I'm like, 500, 500 to a thousand. I would sit there and every hour I would like a hundred photos. And people are like, why do you do that? I'm like, one, it's going to gain followers. It's going to gain traction. And I get the attentions of brands that I I, I follow and I, I comment on their stuff. And it, it snowballed. It took a long time, but you know, I think in 2017, 18, 18, I signed my first major sponsor and I was like, there, this solved my problem of, of how do I afford my next flight? Yeah. Um, but not only that, the it, it freed up so much mental resources because when you were on the court, it was no longer like, I need to win this game. So I, I win enough money to cover my trip. Mm-hmm. I need to win this next game. So I have enough money to go to the next two trips. When I was able to kind of put that in the back of my mind and play a lot freer, Mm -hmm. it it, it became a lot easier. And I think that that's still something that, um, you know, the youth aren't thinking about is how can I create a a brand for myself? And that's what I really tried to do. I started making my own hats, my own clothes, and that morphed into websites. And then ultimately what I'm doing now, making programs. But when you, if you want to use the internet in that way, there's, there's nothing stopping you because we live in an age where we are more connected than ever. Like I was doing the RX podcast and Jordan was like, have you, have you ever met this guy? And I was like, I have no idea who this is. And five minutes later I had a message from you being like, Hey, when are we going to do this? Right. We live in the most connected age ever. So take advantage of it, find your niche and find what you're good at. And, uh, you know, if you want to try and make money off the internet, there's, there's nothing stopping you. Yeah. And it's like, yo, if you have an interest in something, go do it. Yeah. Like test it, yeah. taste it. Maybe it doesn't work out, but it, what you proved is that you do need to stay consistent. Yeah. That's the biggest thing I see people like starting trying to do one off things. And I'm like, yo, if you can commit to doing this for five years, then do it yeah. and like wrap your head around. Okay. What's this going to be like in five years? Then we'll reevaluate. But 
you don't know what you're going to be able to build over time and the connections you're going to be able to make. Like, you know, two and a half years ago when Jordan and I were sitting in my living room filming or like in my bedroom filming the first 50 episodes of the athletes podcast, I wasn't like, Oh yeah. In a year and a half, I'll be talking to team Canada athletes and you know, Jordan shallow is going to be chatting with me and I'll be co-hosting up for RX. Like that wasn't going to be happening, but you know, doors open. Yeah, you get involved and you get to exposed to all these new things. And you're like, oh, wow, I actually really like talking to people. And I like being able to train and going and deadlifting before we do a yeah. podcast. Like, that's just stuff that doesn't typically happen or it wasn't done before. But like, hey, let's carve our own path. Yeah. And how you do that is going to evolve, right? Like, there's no way I, I don't like any photos on Instagram anymore because I've built up enough of a reputation and audience that I don't need to be like just going through hashtags now and liking all of these photos. It, it will evolve. What you're doing is not going to be the same for five years. And if you do it, you're probably not doing it correctly. But um, you, you learn, you learn quickly what works and, and, and what doesn't work. And you know, it's, it's not a short term solution. It's a, it's a long term game. Mm -hmm. I, everything is life yeah. is long. Yeah, exactly. People don't recognize that. Hey, like at 20, you're barely past the first quarter. Like, well, that's me at what I, f I finished the last season at 34 and only now am I starting to work as a physio. Like I graduated in 2012. Like I always used to tell everyone and I, I don't like what I used to tell everyone now, but I, I always used to say like, I'm delaying real life. Mm. They're like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I play professional volleyball. And then people will be like, oh, it's almost time to get a real job. And I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm just putting off real life. And it took me a long time to realize like, no, this is real life. Like right now, what you're doing is like, it's legit. There's a lot of people who want to do what you do. You've created a situation where you're financially stable. You know, you have a wife, you've got a kid. Like this is real life right now. You're not delaying real life. Like start to enjoy real life right now. This isn't some fantasy that you're just putting off your regular life for. Mm -hmm. Just being present is overstated and not done. You know, people talk about it all the time, but people don't really like take yeah. that deep breath and like just realize wait. you're in San Pedro's basement and he just deadlifted over 500 pounds for the <laughs> first time life, in your life. Lifetime PB. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, they're they're just waiting for the next thing, right? They're yeah. they're just looking for the next and like the next thing could be tomorrow, so you might as well enjoy today. Yeah, and you gotta smell the roses because <laughs> tomorrow's not given. Might not pull 550 tomorrow either. So. Yeah, right? Like my back might give out here on the, as I'm walking up the stairs. Come see me in the clinic. We'll take care of that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that was strategic on your part. <laughs> no, hey, you're no. like, I'll pull this guy in and get him to pull a bunch no, of No, it was, it was confidence. I, I knew you had more in you and we pulled it right out of you. It's true. It's true. You did that. Um, yo, anything else that you want to pass on to that next generation? We typically wrap up every episode by asking our guest what their biggest piece of advice would be. And I think you've got a ton of knowledge. Yeah. You've got a ton of experience. You've worked with thousands of athletes now. Anything stick out to you that you'd love to leave as that last piece, that cherry on top? Yeah, and like I always think about this and I'm always like, I hate when I say this, but I, I never end up coming up with anything else. But it's it's so cliche, but it's like, don't don't give up. Like if you like what you do, don't give up. Like I've been told, you know, I, was, I, I wasn't strong enough. I, I wasn't good enough to be a setter. And then I wasn't good enough to be a left side. No, no, I wasn't good enough to be a middle. Like if you listen to the, all of that naysayers, and especially because we're specializing earlier and earlier, like how can we make that call? How do we know the 14U kid being recruited to go to USC in the States to play volleyball? How do we know they're going to be the best 18U kid? So if you're the 14 u kid who's being told like, hey, uh, I don't really think you're going to make it, like, says who? Mm. Like, find it within yourself. If you love the sport, continue to play. And that's what happened to me was I just had this like, like this childhood love of volleyball that was developed through my parents and my friends. And all I wanted to do was play. And when people said like, oh, hey, you know what? You might not be good enough. I was like, well, like, I still have an awesome time playing. So like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to stop because you told me that I'm not going to be a professional? Well, I never thought I was going to be a professional either. And I just kept at it and, and it happened. So, you know, don't give up if it's something you love. If, it, it, if it's not something you love, then we need to have a different conversation. But if, if you really love what you're doing, whether it be sport, you know, academia, music, whatever it might be, don't, don't listen to like, I love the kids call them the old heads. Don't listen to the old heads that are telling you that you might not be, you might not fit into their model. That is what you're supposed to be. Just, just keep at it.
Wise words, because I, I I wanted you to kind of leave on that because you've been someone who's been able to overcome adversity, deal with X, Y, Z, and you still are performing at the t best of the best, the top level. So kudos to you. Keep doing what you're doing, man. Right.